perhaps the most noteworthy finding and consistent finding is that concerning age. Um, young children in particular uh, have been the focus of much of this work, and the evidence consistently indicates that even young children can describe their experiences, sometimes in quite an accurate manner, but their reports tend to be brief and incomplete. With age, children gradually provide more detail. They also are less susceptible to influences of questions in others. So there's a decrease in suggestibility. Also, and of interest with age, is that children actually begin to say, I don't know more often. Anyone who spent time with a three or four year old knows that most three and four year olds actually think they know everything. And it's not until they're older that they recognize that they don't. Now, these age related improvements, we can begin with young children, but the evidence indicates that these age related improvements continue through adolescence. So it's not as though children hit age nine or 10 and then they suddenly become adult like in their memory and reporting abilities. They continue to change. With age, the amount of detail provided in memory reports improves and accuracy of information provided improves. Adolescents are still susceptible to manipulation. They can also be led to error. So they're not immune to it, even if they think they are. Um, uh, they're also strongly influenced by motivations and perceptions in ways that shape both whether and what they elect to report. So another approach that has been very well tested in the forensic interviewing literature is via the use of what we call follow-up prompts and implicit encouragement. So follow-up prompts are really kind of ideal and easy types of prompts to embed after recall. Um, and what they allow is, you know, once a child or an adolescent has said one thing, you can say, oh, you said X, tell me more about that. And in that way, what you're doing is you are guiding the topic. You are kind of focusing a child on particular topics of importance without leading them down a particular path and without exposing them to potentially suggestive content that they have not already disclosed. Implicit encouragement is simply a broad category of, of, kind of verbal and nonverbal cues that indicate interest in what a child says. And so the simplest of which is just a pause. And I promise you, if you ask a child a question and then you pause and it's silent, 90% of the time children will talk because they don't like the silence and they'll fill in the gaps. What they also will do is they will learn if you pause multiple times that it's their job to answer questions. Kind of, I wanna go on just for a few moments and just kind of talk about stepping back for a moment to think broadly about the approaches that we can use when we're questioning these victims. I focus on the questions themselves, but the context surrounding victims is also incredibly crucial to what victims say. So across the board, another finding from the forensic interviewing literature is that youth are more accurate when they're questioned in an unintimidating than intimidating context. Um, and these benefits are really consistent across age. Um, they're strongest with young children, but you really do see these with adolescents. And so when adolescents are interviewed in a warm, supportive manner, in a relaxing manner, they tend to do better when, than when they're interviewed um, in a kind of in an interrogation room, in a cold and neutral setting by individuals who maintain a more professional rather than calming demeanor. So kind of the final things about context, um, and these are really coming from frontline law enforcement. Um, the Orange County Tax Force, where I am, has kind of a really great model for this. Um, but the context also includes food. Uh, many of these, these kids, when you pick them up, they're hungry. They haven't had food. And I have hot Cheetos because my 17-year-old said that that's the best food on the planet. So that's always kind of our go-to food when you need to question someone who's a little nervous. 
in addition, rest, sleep. Many of these victims haven't slept consistently in a safe place for a long time. So kind of let get them food, let them rest. Be supportive, but know that they may be evasive. They may provide answers that aren't that useful. But that doesn't mean that that support should end. And finally, ask about and address their needs. Um, there's an increased push to involve medical professionals to do STD testings and the like. So really make sure that their needs are being addressed. One of the things that we're really pushing for is we really need to know what's happening on the law enforcement end, given that these victims are being questioned by law enforcement. Um, what we've been talking to different counties about is maybe they do have uniquely effective strategies for this victim population. If we can pool information across agencies and look at those interviews in more detail, we may be able to kind of identify some of those common threads to begin to make recommendations specific for this population. In addition, what we also need to do is we really need to begin to focus on first responders to make sure that they are kind of well informed, not only about the risk factors for trafficking, but also about disclosures, tendencies and interviewing approaches, because once they identify those risk factors, they're the ones who need to ask those questions in a way that elicits information. And if we can do this, we really are in a better position to identify victims. And identifying the victims is really a crucial step, both to providing services for those victims, but also for ensuring that justice is served for all of our youth.